All right, everybody. I'm not breaking up fellowship, but Pastor Greg gave the nod. All right, everybody. I, don't worry. I'm not the one speaking today. I'm not the guest speaker. Um, but I, I just I kind of felt like the Lord gave me a word to share, so I want to share it with everybody. Um, kind of one of those times where like, you feel that burning inside if you don't say it. So, uh, you know, as we were singing, um, one of the lyrics in the songs was talking about, like, we're filled with his power. And, and it made me think, like, I love to see the Lord work in really powerful ways. Um, I love to see miracles happen. It's a beautiful thing to see God work in those ways. Sometimes when you don't see those, maybe you feel kind of let down that something didn't happen. There wasn't a healing. There wasn't something that happened. But I just want us to remember that the Holy Spirit has worked a powerful, miraculous work in us for us to, to actually love God in the first place. Um, one, of the, one of the verses um, in First Thessalonians says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. You know, I'll tell you that not every single person believes that this is the word of God. Not every person has a desire in their heart to love God, to serve God, to grow in their relationship with him. That's only done by a powerful work of the Holy Spirit. So as you pray for miracles, amen, yes and amen. Um, but as you spend that time with the Lord, know that that drawing and that calling is a powerful work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So he is working and he is moving. And I'm going to keep praying for the miracles. And just remember, though, that he has already done that work inside of you in a powerful way. Thank you, JJ. Well, I'm about to introduce my uh, new friend and our speaker today. Before I do, if you need a loaner Bible, there are some on the back table, uh, along with some bulletins where you can take notes on the back. And kids, there are also some activity sheets back there. And you know that Pastor Greg loves to see what you color, especially if it relates to the sermon. So listen carefully, kids. But uh, today, it is my privilege to introduce Tim Summers. Tim uh, lives here in the area. Uh, I think like 25 years ago, we were both at Southwestern Seminary. I think we missed each other by about a year or two as far as actually being in class at the same time. But uh, Tim and his wife, Catherine, have six kids all grown. She is a, uh, a nurse, and so she actually is serving at a summer camp as a nurse right now. But uh, would you join me in welcoming Tim Summers this morning? Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> it's um, an honor, and I'm thankful to be here to share with you a message that I think uh, that's been that is close to my heart. It's part of God's ongoing revelation to me of who He wants to be for me in my life, and I think who he wants to be for all of us. Um, yeah, my wife, Catherine, uh, we've been married 31 years, and we, um, <clears throat> she's a little sad that she doesn't get to be here today. She says it seems that every time I get an opportunity to preach, she's out of town. And, um, but you also may notice the impact of her being out of town, because I depend on her greatly. So if you notice any flaws in my appearance, just understand that she is not here. Um, but it's kind of interesting if you think about it. Um, in our relationship, she keeps me on track and I help keep her sane. And so that's kind of the nature of relationships, isn't it? Each party benefits the other in some way. And I think we're going to kind of see that as we look at our relationship with God today. <clears throat> the title of our relationship, of our message today is God's plan for relationship. And if you would go and open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. Uh, to start with, I want to share with you uh, something, an experience that I had back in 2015. Um, I had a personal spiritual awakening. I was at a point where I was desperate for God. I was tired of the sin that just kept creeping back into my life that I could never seem to finally get rid of. Um, I was so desperate that I began calling out to God every day and asking him to do something in my life, in my heart. Um, and as a result, I began, uh, I got this hunger for the word and I began to dig into his word every day, hours every day. Actually, I was 
I was spending an hour or two before work in the Word. Every moment, like on my phone, when I went to the bathroom even, I was in the Word. Um, and in the middle of the night, as I often did at that time, I would wake up in the middle of the night and be awake for an hour or two. And that time was a blessing because I would just go downstairs and sit alone and just read God's Word. And during this time, <clears throat> he began to open his word to me and show me things about himself and about the, the character and the nature of a relationship with him that he wants us to have. He began to show me that um, our relationship is comprised of, first, a love for him, that we have to love him. But that love then turns into obedience because he tells us, you don't love me if you don't obey my words. Um, but here's the interesting thing I learned about obedience as I began to actually try to obey him. I'd been praying to love him more, and he grew my love for him, but then I tried to turn that into obedience, and I discovered that I couldn't obey without faith, <laughs> that in order to step out in obedience, I actually had to grow my faith, to trust him, that when I obeyed him, he would come through that he would accomplish whatever it was that he said he would do, whatever it was he wanted to accomplish in me. A couple of years ago, I started praying and asking the Lord, um, what is the whole point of all of this? What is your plan? Like, what is it? We know the gospel. We know what God has done. We, you know, he started back in Genesis all the way up through Christ we know what he did, but I wanted to understand why. What was he getting at? What was his purpose? What was his plan? And as I was praying, I felt the Lord say, look at the end. So I turned to the book of Revelation, and um, in anticipation, I began reading the last several chapters, and I saw the great events that would happen, all of the conflicts, and they all built toward the millennial reign of Christ, and then the judgment of all creation. And then I came to chapter 21, and I think I found my answer. So read with me, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. <clears throat> and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. <clears throat> but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. <clears throat> now, as we consider this passage and we start looking at it, beginning in verses 1 and 2, we kind of see God is doing a new thing, isn't he? He's doing something that's never been done before. In verse 1, he, uh, the, John says that he saw a new heaven and a new earth. <clears throat> but this isn't just God, like, starting something new. This is him starting over. And it's the final, the fullest starting over that there could be, because the old heaven and the old earth passed away. Hebrews uh, chapter 12, 27 talks about 
uh, God shaking things, shaking the created things, so that what would remain will be what is eternal, what is with him, what is for him, what he desires. And so the old heaven, the old earth passed away. We have a new heaven and a new earth. But not only that, we also have a new Jerusalem. And it's coming down out of heaven. Why is it coming down out of heaven? I don't know. But the interesting thing is we're going to learn later. We're going to see that this is where God's throne is. And so earlier in John's revelation in the vision, he saw the throne room in heaven. And he saw all the worship that was happening there. And now God's throne is coming down. He's going to be among his people. He's going to rule among his people. He's going to be present with us. And this is the new Jerusalem. But there's also something you want to notice about this passage. It has a parallel structure. So verses 1 through 4 are actually repeated and carried forward in verses 5 through 8. So skip down to verse 5 with me. And we see that God says, behold, I am making all things new. He's repeating the theme. He wants us to understand this is something completely new, completely different. But yet it's not something unexpected. It's something he's been building toward. He's been working toward. And then at the beginning of verse 6, God says, it is done. It is done. These words sort of have a sound of familiarity to us, doesn't it? Um, I think, did we see it earlier? Um, When Jesus was on the cross in John 19.30, he said, it is finished. And what did he mean when he said, it is finished? He meant the work of redemption that he was doing, the whole point, the whole purpose of him going to the cross to pay the penalty in order to bring us back into relationship with God, back where we're supposed to be. This was a necessary event. It had to happen. It is finished. But here when God says it is done, he means the whole plan, not just paying the penalty, the whole thing. He's brought it to its conclusion. So what is the point? What is the purpose? Look with me at verses 3 and 4. This, I think, is the heart of the passage. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Now we'll talk a little bit later about verse 4 a little bit more, but um, verse 4 shows that this is something new. There's no more death in this new creation. It's a complete shift from anything we can think or imagine. But in verse 3, God tells us his tabernacle, his dwelling, that's what that word means, his living place, his house, is among men, right? And then this isn't a tabernacle or like the one in the Old Testament. This isn't like the temple where God is separate and in his own little place and you have to go there to worship him. No, this is God actually living in fullness among us. We see later in chapter 21 and in chapter 22, we see that um, there is no, it actually says there is no temple because God and Christ are its temple. And that there's no need of light or a sun because God is the light that is shining, providing light to all men. This is a complete shift. It's an amazing thing that God is doing. But this dwelling of God, being with his people, is something that started all the way back at the beginning. And sometimes we boil the gospel down to just the plan of salvation. You know, we're a sinner. 
We need God. We need to pray, confess, right? Believe. But the gospel is more than that. It's the entire story of what God has done. And his purpose, his reason for doing it is an important part of that. And I think when we understand God's purpose, it shifts our understanding of who we are and how we should be relating to him. So if we think back to the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, when God is creating the heaven and the earth, he says in verse 26, let us make man in our image. In our image. Why would he make man in his image? He created Adam and Eve. He put them in the Garden of Eden. He would walk in the garden and fellowship with them. Imagine what it was like to have that kind of relationship with God. I often wish I had that kind of relationship with God, and then I think about Revelation chapter 21, and I realize I will one day. But why made in his image? Because if we're not in his image, we can't truly and fully relate to him. Don't you think? But the story goes on. It's not a happy ending yet. And in Genesis chapter 3, we know that Satan tempts Eve. Adam and Eve disobey God. They eat of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, Why was it bad to eat from the fruit of the tree? Well, primarily disobedience, but there is a whole other sermon in that whole knowledge of good and evil thing. They just needed to obey God, but they couldn't. So in their disobedience, sin enters the world. And when sin enters the world, separation comes. They're kicked out of the Garden of Eden, right? They have to go it on their own. Well, this sin over the next generations builds and grows to the point where God gets fed up with man and with his sinfulness and he decides he's going to start over so we see in genesis chapter 6 through 9 that god decides he's going to wipe the world out with a flood but fortunately there is one man who still seeks god one man who is still righteous and god chooses noah commands him to build an ark whatever that is it's a box Why a box that would float in the water? It's an amazing thing. That's almost a miracle of God right there. But he sends the flood, and he brings Noah and his family through the flood safely. And he starts over with man. Maybe this time. I'm starting with a righteous man. Maybe this time it will work. But God knew that that was not going to complete the work So later on, eventually, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we see where God calls Abraham. And here is where he actually begins the process of bringing man back to himself in relationship. He calls Abraham, and he commands Abraham to go to the land of Canaan. He promises that he will give the land of Canaan to his descendants. And he promises that through his descendants, all of the earth would be blessed. This is actually a little ironic, because Abraham was old, and he had no kids. Think about that. When God calls us to do something, he wants to be the one who accomplishes it, not us. So he calls Abraham to do something that he had no control over. Abraham, in his obedience, follows. He goes to Canaan. God gives him a son. God supernaturally superintends his plan and his purpose. And that son has kids, and they grow eventually to become a nation. But if you would, go ahead and open to Exodus chapter 19. Um, We see 
that this nation was in um, slavery in Egypt at the time. So God calls and delivers them from their bondage. He leads them out into the wilderness, into nothingness, where they had nothing and had to depend solely on him. He leads them to Mount Sinai, where he's going to give them a new covenant. He's going to renew his covenant with Abraham, but he's going to carry it forward. So look with me at verses 4 through 6 of chapter 19. God says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Look at what God says to them. He tells them that he brought them to himself. See, God wants us to be with him. He didn't create us just so he could rule from on high. He wants us to be with him. So he brings Israel to himself. He calls them his own possession. This is personal and this is intimate. This is God's heart. And he says that they are to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They are to be set apart, holy set apart from the world, different from the world. But they're a kingdom of priests. They're actually supposed to minister to the world, to connect the world to God. That's what priests are supposed to do. That was their mission. But yet, they kind of got inward focus and thought it was all about them and that they were special. But God gives them a new covenant. And you see, The old covenant that he made with Abraham didn't have a lot of conditions except for circumcision, which was the sign that they were different. But now under the new covenant, he tells them that they are to obey his voice and keep his commandments. He's adding something more to it. He's requiring more of them. But along with that, he's also promising something more. He's promising more blessings. And we see in Exodus chapter 29, verse 45, that God tells them that he will um, dwell among them and he will be their God. Sound familiar? It's kind of repeated in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. Um, He says something similar in Leviticus 26 because he wanted them to know he was actually serious about this. And so we fast forward through time And Israel is now in their promised land. They have a king. Uh, King David is the king. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, God makes a covenant with David. He says um, that his descendant will be on the throne forever. He will rule forever. But even more importantly, in verse 14 of chapter 7, he says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Well, this is a new and special kind of relationship we haven't seen yet. So David's descendant, the son of David, God would be a father to him and he would be a son to God. And as we go through the Old Testament, we see all the prophecies, all of the promises that God is making, building toward ultimately, as we know, its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes to earth and he walks among men and big reveal, Jesus is God. He is the son of God. He is God dwelling among his people. But this time he's not tied to a temple. He's walking around encountering people. 
He's teaching. He's preaching. He's healing them. He's ministering to their needs. But the problem, the downside was Jesus could only be with a few people at a time. So he had his disciples. He had his followers. Those were the ones that he had the most intimate relationship with. And we see some wonderful moments in the Gospels. Um, the one that comes to mind is in John chapter 11 when he raises Lazarus from the dead. When he shows up at the tomb and Mary and Martha both say to him, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus weeps. You think he was weeping for Lazarus? He was feeling their grief because he loved them. And so, <clears throat> we come to, uh, if you would, go ahead and turn to John chapter 14. And Jesus it, tells his disciples at the end of his ministry, on the last night that he's with them, he tells them that he is leaving, that he is going away, and he can tell that they're kind of sad about this whole idea. But he also tells them that, he has to go away because if he doesn't go away, they won't get the greater thing that God has in mind, the greater thing that's coming. See, right now he can just relate to a few of them and only externally, the way you and I relate to each other. But he promises to them that he is going to send the Holy Spirit that will dwell within them and they will get to really know God. Read with me John chapter 14, verses uh, 15 through 26. <clears throat> if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but it does not see or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am the Father, I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? I want to pause right there. <clears throat> Why is he asking this question? Because they thought he, Jesus was coming to be a king. He was going to disclose himself to the world. But God, God had a different plan. And he's only showing himself to his people. Verse 23 Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Jesus makes some big and bold promises here. He tells them that the Holy Spirit is going to come and dwell inside of them. He is going to live inside of them. He promises that, they, that the Holy Spirit will teach them, will lead them. This is new and different. This is radical. God is living inside of me. But what are the implications of that? He also commands, tells them that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love and obedience are tied together, folks. You can't love God without obeying him. If you think you're loving God and you're not obeying him, you are not loving God. 
That was one of the things I learned in 2015. That was my sin problem, folks. I wasn't obeying God. I wasn't loving him the way he wanted to be loved. And so, he tells us that if we keep his commandments in verse 23, that he and the Father will come and make their abode in us. They will do this through the Holy Spirit because as we know, if you understand the Trinity, the God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are one. They're three persons, but they are one. Where one is, all of them are. It's an amazing thing. <clears throat> It'll blow your mind if you try to figure it out. But the Holy Spirit lives within us. And this means that we have immediate access to God all the time. Anytime we need him, he is here for us. And this is God's plan of relationship. In the end, in eternity, he is going to break the barriers. Sin will be no more. And I don't even know what it's going to look like. But we are going to be living in relationship with him. That's his purpose. That's his plan. But he's made it a possibility today, here and now. Eternity starts now. Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit is in us as a seed, as a deposit, an earnest payment for eternity. We have eternity in our hearts, guys. We have God in our hearts, if you know him. It's interesting, uh, <clears throat> one of the verses that was big to me back in 2015, we read this morning, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Um, one of the things I discovered that God showed me was how Paul actually several times tells us to pray all the time. And in this verse, he says, <clears throat> be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, right? And he promises that the peace of God will surpass all understanding, will guard our hearts. And so we have this promise. God is with us, and we can turn to him in everything, in anything. He will be there. He will teach us. He will lead us. He will empower us. He will comfort us. Whatever it is that we need, we have right now because we have him. So let's um, turn back to Revelation chapter 21 and let's finish the story. We looked at um, God's plan of relationship and we saw, um, but I want us to look now at the character of that relationship. Uh, let's read verses 6 and 7 of chapter 21. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. First, when we look at verse 6, we see part of the character of God's relationship with us is one of blessing. <clears throat> he says here that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What does that mean? He started it all, right? He's the first, the Alpha, first letter of the Greek alphabet. He started it all with creation, and he brought it all to an end the omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, he brings it all to an end right here. He said, it is done. But there's an implication for us also. He created man in the beginning as the alpha, and now he brings us to our fulfillment where we're supposed to be in him and with him. <clears throat> he promises that he will um, give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. 
<clears throat> this is a blessing. Just like in verse 4 where he said there would be no more tears, no de more death, no more pain. Here, there will be no more thirst. That's good. I'm actually a little thirsty right now. But he's going to give the water of life. This is something new and different and special. And it implies that we will have eternal satisfaction with God. We won't have any needs to be concerned about, any worries to be concerned about. And then we go to verse 7, and here we see he's going to make a shift that we're not completely unfamiliar with, and he's talking about intimacy. He says, he who overcomes will inherit these things. What does it mean, he who overcomes? Well, it sort of harkens back to the beginning of Revelation, the first three chapters, the seven letters to the seven churches. And in there, he repeatedly uses the phrase, he who overcomes, and he promises different blessings to the overcomers. And in each situation, in each letter, the churches are dealing with different trials and temptations. And overcoming means having victory in those trials and temptations. <clears throat> but here, there's a little bit, oh, thank you. Here, there's a little bit different focus. <clears throat> he says, um, that's a heart of service right there. <laughs> he says, but the one who overcomes, I will be his God and he will be my son. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? But it's not just promised to one person. That prophecy was for David promising the coming Messiah, the sending of God's Son, who is God. But here he echoes that we are all adopted as son. <clears throat> We've heard this before. Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 8 and in Galatians, where he talked about us as sons of God, our spirits crying out, Abba, Father. John talked about this in 1 John chapter 3. The first three verses, when he talks about us being children of God. And here it comes to its real fulfillment. We are living with God as sons. And being a son means an heir. It means having ownership. It means being part of the plan, not just an observer, not just a tool. He's elevating us from the level of servants. Now, to be sure, we are servants. You read all of the epistles in the New Testament, and they almost all call themselves bond servants of God. <clears throat> we are, but we're elevated to walk as sons, to be part of what he's doing. This is intimacy, guys. So God's plan for relationship is infinitely more than we can even really conceive. And the only way for us to truly, really understand and appreciate it is to begin walking into it. We have the Holy Spirit. We have access to that relationship now. We can start walking into eternity. <clears throat> One of the things I've become convinced of, and this is not strictly scriptural, but I've become convinced of over the last 10 years of seeking to walk in intimacy with the Lord, <clears throat> is that this life is a training ground for eternity. And what we choose here matters in eternity. Back when we talked about um, the beginning of the gospel, <clears throat> the fact that God gave Adam and Eve freedom to sin was because he wanted them to choose a relationship with him. And they failed. But isn't it fitting that in the gospel, those of us who choose him in this life get to be with him in eternity. And those who reject him in this life will be separated from him for eternity.
But what we choose matters in eternity. And I want to encourage you to start walking in the fullness of your relationship with God today. Um, God wants intimacy with us where we pour every part of our heart to him and we listen to him for every part of his heart, right? In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said for us to pray, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth. Guess where that is? Right here. As it is in heaven. <clears throat> he wants us to seek his will. In Matthew 6, uh, 33, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So in other words, we need to seek God, press into him, seek intimacy with him. And we can depend on him because he will provide all those other things that we need. So in response today, um, there are two basic responses for us to make. The first is, if you haven't been, either just this week or over a period of time, really seeking God, trying to live with Him and walk with Him, this is a time for renewal and recommitment. Maybe you're desperate for God like I was, and you're feeling the weight of everything. Or maybe you just recognize that you need Him. You can't live this life without him um, i know i can't then today is a time to ask god to help you and to seek him and to commit to seek him every day and maybe you are seeking him every day maybe you your relationship with god is great well guess what guys there's always more there's always a next step there is a next level in our relationship with god because he is infinite, and he is infinitely amazing. <clears throat> God wants to be everything to us. He is our source of guidance. He is our one who provides for us, who empowers us. He is the one who comforts us in the middle of anything. He's the one who encourages us to do anything. We need him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of our message today, I ask that you would um, speak to our hearts right now. <clears throat> Show us where we are with you and what we need from you. And Lord, the commitment to walk with you every day, to seek you every day is a hard thing because the world is so full of distractions. But Lord, I ask that you would give us a single-minded focus, a heart that craves you and only you. Lord, I ask that you would reveal yourself to us right now that you would show us more of you, and that you would show us what are those next steps that you have in mind for us. What is it that you want to accomplish in us and through us, Father? Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we give our whole heart to you. In your name, amen. Thank you. Let's stand together.